Hey traders, this is Blake Morrow with Trader Summit and I have Mr. Eric B from EPB Macro Research. And how do I get one of those hats? I love it. <laughs> we just got these in. How you doing, Blake? <laughs> I'm doing great, Eric. You know, it's been it's been a while. It's been it's been a while since we've had a chance to catch up and um it's good to see you. And uh, you know, I'm so interested because I know you focus a lot on the real estate market, but you also focus on what's happening in the broader economy and what's happening with possible recession coming. But let me let me start off by saying this. Um, you know, and I've I've heard a few people say this. Uh, you know, we're climbing the wall of worry. You know, stocks continue to break to the upside. The the and and uh this is probably the one of the most highly anticipated recessions coming. What do you have to say about that? And do you think we're actually gonna have a recession? Yeah. So this is obviously the most common question that that's been happening over the last couple of weeks. And it's funny, it's it's totally driven by market sentiment, right? When sure. when the market was falling after uh, Silicon Valley and First Republic, the recession was on, then the market goes up, the recession's off. So everyone's feeling about recessions lives or dies by the last weekly performance of, of the <laughs> stock market. And when, when you go back through history, um, it's and, and you like, you know read periodicals or you read um, you know uh, uh, Wall Street reports or or financial media reports, nobody has any idea the economy is in recession in the early stages of it. So, for example, in Q1 of 2008, you had Fed officials that were talking about the need to potentially start raising interest rates again because retail sales had improved, ISM numbers were, were improving, they thought maybe things had stabilized. So they thought maybe we should start to increase rates again because inflation was high. Yeah. Um, and, and it just goes to show that the economy was already in recession, but they had no idea, right? And this is extremely common throughout history. And um, you know, using the 1970s examples, the, the biggest, um, case study of that would be 1974. There was a recession in 1974. It actually began in December of 1973. So the recession started in December of 1993, uh, 1973, excuse me. Yeah. But you didn't have your first month of job losses until about July of 1974. So the recession okay. started and it took about six to eight months to see negative job numbers. So it is possible to the recession to be underway before the labor market totally falls apart. And it's also very common for the economy to be in recession um, before anybody realizes it. A lot of times what people do when they're talking about where is the recession or what's happening, they're always referring to the climax. And they, and they talk about it as if a recession is an event. Uh, a recession is a is a process, right? So uh, we haven't had the climax yet, which is why people think we haven't had the recession. But people didn't know we were in recession until Lehman failed in really Q3 or almost Q4 of 08, even though it had already been underway for several quarters. So yeah. sentiment has changed a lot. Uh, I have a couple of charts that maybe I can go into, but we're still very much on the recessionary track. And evidence is building to me that um, it's not impossible. The economy is actually in recession now. Well, you know, it's it's funny you say that because price price drives sentiment. I mean, that just that that's totally. the way the markets are. So if and and uh, there's nothing nothing more that's going to change sentiment than price. <laughs> so you're exactly yes. right yeah. in the in that's that exactly assessment. Right. Um, so, you know, talking about the job market, the job market has been incredibly strong. We've seen, you know, um, um, unprecedented gains in the job market. It seems like every month we we beat uh, the, the the headline number, at least. And um, yeah, I, I'm sure there's other evidence you're going to be looking at as far as wage data and and, mm -hmm. and what's happening with unemployment rate. But what do you what, how do you how are you seeing employment now and when could we expect if we are heading into a recession, we're, we're about heading into the cusp of it. Where do you expect yep. to start to see job losses? Sure. So I'll, I'll back up just a second and show these show these two charts just to give context behind the statement that I just made, because some people will, will want proof behind that statement because it is uh, a, a loaded statement. So what I'm showing here is that a recession uh, defined by the NBER, which is the agency that dates the recessions. Now, 
A common misconception is that the NBER does not try and date these things in real time. They intentionally wait for all the revisions, all the most accurate data, and they're a historical archive. They're not trying to tell you in real time a recession happens. That's all of our jobs. Okay. But they do give us a process on how they go about defining recessions. And it's not two negative quarters of GDP. It's a rule of thumb. And that rule of thumb normally does work, but it's not the real definition. The real definition is that the NBER uses seven indicators for the most part. Those indicators include real personal income, two different measures of employment, the household and establishment survey, personal consumption, so how much are we spending, and um, uh, retail sales, or real retail sales, which is a more narrow version of consumption, and then industrial production. So what you have is you have income, consumption, production, and employment. And then what the NBER does is they try and take all of these data points. And then it, with the benefit of hindsight, they go back and they say, where was the peak in the collection of all of these variables? Since they're not perfectly uniform, some of them will peak earlier than others. But as a, as a basket, where was the collective peak? So I have here six of the seven monthly indicators, and I, and I indexed them back to September of 2022. And what you'll notice is that three of the indicators, real retail sales, industrial production, and real personal income are flat to down relative to September of 2022, which is um, a number of months back. It's certainly enough time where it's a valid signal. It's not like one month. Yeah. The three indicators that are still rising are, as you mentioned, our employment and then our consumption. If you separated these into two baskets, the industrial production, the retail sales, and the real income always decline ahead of the other three. The employment numbers, as I mentioned in the 1974 example, uh, and the broadest measures of real personal consumption oftentimes don't turn down uh, turn negative if they turn negative at all until the middle or end of the recession, because that real personal consumption bucket has a lot of stuff in there like healthcare spending, services type spending that just never really contracts. So, out of the six monthly indicators, you have a split where three of them are essentially uh, ha have peaked uh, several months ago, three of them are still rising. The seventh indicator that the um, NBER uses is actually not real GDP. It's the average of real GDP and real GDI, gross domestic product and gross domestic income. You have to take both sides of the equation. This is a quarterly series. So they use six monthly series and one quarterly series. What's uh, striking is that the average of real GDP and real GDI has contracted for four of the last five quarters. And there's been two, two consecutive contractions in the last two months. So when we look at these seven indicators, um, four of them have peaked or, or, or roughly have peaked. Three of them have not. So if we get more declines from here, then it's entirely possible that when they go back to date this, they say the majority of these coincident indicators peaked in Q4, let's say, of 2022. So it's a it's a technical process. And unless this data looks very different a year from now, or unless we accelerate from here, then it's entirely possible that we could be sitting in the beginning uh, of a recession. I'm not saying it's a certainty because it, it is path dependent. It does um, matter what happens going forward because it is a truism that you do have to have job losses for there, be, for there to be a recession. So essentially, if we do get job losses in the next, call it three to six months, then I think that there's a likelihood that we'll look back historically, unless this is all revised and different, that the peak in a majority of the indicators will have been likely in Q4 of 22. So that's the reason I make the statement and wrapping the labor into it, the labor is usually the last of those indicators to go down. And like I said, in the 1974 example, which was uncoincidentally a inflationary recession, uh, yeah. labor does have a tendency. There is some evidence that labor does lag even more 
in the inflationary recessions because of this money illusion. So that's the that's the overall scheme of how I'm arriving at that. Okay, and so so, but um, to to add, to just ask you my original question, you you see maybe the next three to six months, you're going to start to see the labor market falter a little. Yeah, bit. and and the, and some some signs that we're seeing are we have leading indicators of employment, right? And those leading indicators of employment are falling sharply. A couple examples of that would be we're starting to see increases in the initial and continued jobless claims data, albeit slow increases, but it's definitely increasing. Sure. And we also see a pretty sizable reduction in temporary help workers, which is a category that's reported in each monthly report. That has declined significantly. And then we're also seeing very sharp declines across the board in the number of hours worked. So we, we know that employers will cut hours before they cut headcount or cut bodies. So we're seeing very sharp declines in manufacturing hours and services hours as well. So the leading indicators of employment are telling us that we should be expecting these contractions. Those are, are, are certainly big and pronounced declines. And then we, when we look into the jobs report, while the numbers are strong, we do see some of the underlying trends uh, worsening. So evidence of that would be um, the... For example, in the last report, the household survey lost jobs, even though the uh, headline number uh, gained jobs. But most importantly, I track what I call cyclical jobs. Cyclical jobs would include construction, manufacturing, those temporary help workers that I mentioned, and then trucking and transportation, sort of the lifeblood of the economy. Interesting. Over the last um, six months, those sectors have lost jobs five out of the last six months. I look at a wow. three-month average. So you are seeing job losses in some of the pockets of the economy that generally do lead. Um, it's it's definitely arriving later than, than I would have thought. I would have thought some of these job losses would have been closer to the start of this year, but they but they're end up happening closer to the middle of this year. We are seeing those job losses. So that would tell me... Um, directionally, we're still going to see the weakness proliferate to the rest of the uh, labor market. Okay. You know, and and you, you'd made mention that, you know, you're seeing employers are cutting hours and they're not, they, they're not letting people go because jobs were, or finding these people have been hard to, that's hard, exactly especially right. exactly post COVID right. era. Right. And then you, 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 you train folks, you educate them, you train them, like you don't want to let them go immediately just it's because exactly you right. sniff a little bit of weakness, right? And this so. is why the inflationary aspect to some of these recessions causes labor to lag more than normal because um, revenue is still quite high, right? Because revenue is a nominal concept. Yeah. So yeah. revenue is high, but these companies aren't producing a lot of units, they're not really selling a lot of things or items, even though the revenue is kind of staying puffed up and inflated. So they're seeing their productivity numbers fall, but their revenue is kind of holding in. So they say, I can still pay these people because my revenue hasn't collapsed, but they're not really doing anything because I'm not really producing any goods. So just like you said, instead of laying these people off and then having to rehire them, if we do happen to have a soft landing or a rebound, what their employees are saying is, I'll keep the head count, but I'll dramatically reduce everybody's hours. That'll help me you know, keep costs down, protect my margins while we're going through this slump. And if we happen to recover, then I can add their hours right back with very little friction. Yeah. But what I think is going to happen and what's uh, evident in, in the other inflationary recessions is that they do cut the hours, hoping for that soft landing. They hold on, they hold on, they hold on. And then it doesn't come. And then they're ultimately forced to kind of reduce headcount pretty abruptly, everybody at once. So in the 1974 example, the economy was adding jobs, like I said, for eight months into the recession. Uh, and I believe in, in my numbers will be slightly off, but I believe in July of 74, the economy added about 20,000 jobs. And that was, a, that was a positive month. We hadn't had a negative month up until then. And I think by October... So maybe three months later, we went from positive 20 to negative 600. Wow. That fast. Wow. So, yeah. so that's the that's the type of dynamic I'm trying to explain where they're reducing hours, hoping for this soft landing. If it doesn't come, 
they're in a kind of a pinch and they have to shed the labor quite quickly. So that, that, that um, probably was, you're, you're probably answering my next question. My next question would be uh, in your view, based on the data that you're seeing um, you're, you're not seeing a, a no landing. You're not seeing a soft landing. You're, you're forecasting more of a hard landing uh, type of recessionary period. Right. So, you know, as I showed in those coincident indicators on balance, they're um, still cooling. It's yeah. not, you know, we're not seeing all six of them collapse. We're not seeing the labor ones collapse. But as I do in a lot of my client reports, I take all uh, six of those indicators and I smush them into one index. And then we can kind of track that collective basket. And that collective basket is uh, still growing, but the growth rate is slow. And we've gone from three to two to one. And now we're at like 1.1. I think it was wow. the last reading. So it's kind of gliding down, 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 down. Um, we use our leading indicators to tell us, is that glide path going to keep going down or is it going to turn higher? Nothing in the leading indicators pretty much at all tells me that we're going to stop this downward you know, descent that we're having. So my, my forecast is still very much that those indicators are going to keep moving down, down, down. Um, the speed at which they move down as we're finding out and we're living through is very difficult to forecast. We have a lot more confidence directionally and directionally, I'm quite confident that we're going to still see uh, more slowing from here. And when you're starting from a base of about 1%, you can't really afford to slow that much more. Sure. Sure. Okay. Well, that, that makes sense. And, and that goes without saying, um, you know, to get your information and get your, 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 your readings that you compile um, together, you'd go to EPB macro research to get that. Correct. Yep, that's right. And I put a lot of free stuff out on Twitter. So you, you can find me on Twitter. Um, and I, I put out links all the time. So and I'm not um, letting yeah. you go anywhere. Just I just want to make sure I, I plug that really quick. <laughs> <laughs> okay, great. Yeah. No, very good. Very good. good. All right. So I, I got I got two last topics I really want to please, talk to yeah, you about. Please. Um I, I do want to talk about housing, but before I talk about housing, okay. which may fight feed into uh housing, let's talk a little bit about rates and where the Fed's at. Um, you know, we, we, we're in a, we're in a situation where we got, you know, uh, home loans, you know, the, the I, I guess, you know, 30, 30 year mortgage, probably around 7%. You got the 10 year mm -hmm. yield closing in on 4%, um, seems unprecedented levels, uh, with yields yet the market and the economy seems like it's holding up relatively well. Where do you see the fed going from here? I mean, I know that a lot of people talk about the, the, the pause, the skip, the skip, the, yeah. The, the skip, skip is a new one. Yeah. yeah, we got the Bank of Canada just met this morning. Right. They raised rates after pausing. So you could call that a skip. Reserve Bank of Australia yesterday, last night, two nights ago, same thing. Uh, how do you feel about the Fed and what their future path of rate, rate hikes or pause skip will be? Right. So uh, to answer that, I'll, I'll just give a little bit of context. So those seven indicators that I... Uh, showed. If you smush them together, they're growing at about, let's call it 1%, right? Okay. And then you have uh, about 4% inflation. So nominal growth, proxy nominal growth is uh, about 5%, right? It's slightly elevated from normal, but it's coming down quite quickly. And it's not something that really should give the Fed that much concern from a historical perspective. But the Fed looks at... Uh, core services, inflation, and employment, which are two brutally lagging indicators, as we mentioned in some of those charts. So if you take core inflation and employment, just those two components, and you smush them together, they're growing at about 7.5%. Wow. So where the Fed should be looking uh, is towards the leading and coincident indicators. The leading indicators are pointing down and the coincident indicators have kind of slowed back to their historical norms. Uh, but the lagging stuff, the stuff that the Fed looks at, looks like it's still way above trend. Um, so if I had blinders on and I was only able to look at non-farm payrolls and core inflation, I could understand why they're still worried that we're not all the way back to trend. But if we believe in business cycles and we do believe that those indicators are lagging indicators, then we should have an idea of their future trajectory by looking at stuff that comes earlier in the sequence. 
So I would have a high degree of confidence that those indicators, those employment and the inflation numbers will come down and will normalize because of what's happened in the earlier part of the sequence. Therefore, the Fed should not be continuing with monetary tightening. Now, I'm not saying they have to start cutting rates aggressively or anything like that, but they should be uh, a little bit more receptive to the fact that they do have a lot of lags in which this policy works. Um, so I think that they probably should have uh, been on pause since the end of last year. Um, it still would have had a very tightening effect on the economy because of how high rates are. Yeah. Uh, but they don't follow my process. They follow their own process. And the employment and core inflation numbers, those two items are still elevated. So they're not uh, willing to uh, let go of their tight stance. Uh, I'm I'm not sure if they'll if they'll hike or pause at the next meeting. I think it's a coin flip, depending on maybe how the market trades up until then. Um, but because those two indicators are so lagging, when you go back across history, it's not often that the Fed reacts to those two numbers specifically. They never really get up there and say, uh, you know, core we, we we're declaring victory on core inflation, and now we're going to lower interest rates. And nothing happened, right? The yeah. reason that the employment numbers and inflation numbers end up crashing is because of the earlier parts of the sequence. So I think that they're ultimately going to have to react to a market-related event, and the market event will react to something that's closer to the leading or coincident economy, uh, and then the Fed will just react to that. So you know, the, the nothing has happened in terms of a crisis or a market event post the. Uh, banking hiccup that we had. So if we don't have another event in the same realm as that, then yeah, it's going to be very difficult for the Fed to ease policy given the employment and inflation numbers are quite high. But if we do have another event like that, then the bias is going to be for them to ease. I I have to have a bias towards the, towards the, the easing direction because the macro gravity tells me that one of these um, market events is liable to happen at any moment just because that's where the macro gravity is pulling us. Yeah, that 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 makes a lot of sense. Speaking of like being a product of their own data and maybe not necessarily yours, you know, the, I think the Fed has been uh, has been trying to slow down the housing market. And and I, I'm going to I, I got to give you credit here because you have been calling for a, a crash in the real estate market, but not necessarily in prices. You were talking about a crash in transactions. And I mean, that's what we've seen. We have, but we haven't seen a, a crash in prices. Uh, how do you feel about the housing market where prices are at right now? Because you got people in a standstill, you got people with, you know, they got their mortgage rates sub 4%. They're not moving, but you got rates that are so high that it's, 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 uh, it's, it's, you know, shielding out new buyers uh, to come into the market. So you got this standoff in the real estate market. What do you think is going to happen from here moving forward? Yeah, so I have a I have a cool chart that I'd love to show on the on the housing market. You'll have to forgive the fact that it might be um, it might be one month delayed here, but it'll give you an idea of exactly what's going on in um, in the real estate market. So what this chart shows here is the depth and duration of the home price downturn, depending on a uh, major metropolitan city or major city. This is all Case-Shiller data. So on the bottom axis, we have the number of consecutive months of negative growth. And on the left-hand axis, we have the percentage decline from peak. Um, so this kind of shows the dispersion of what's happening to home prices across the country and why some people are saying, hey, look, I don't see any home prices at all. You're crazy. And other people are saying, no, I, I do see a home price decline. It is happening. Um, so if you look in the upper left-hand corner, those are the parts of the country that genuinely haven't seen any declines at all. You're looking at uh, places like Atlanta, Miami, Charlotte, uh, Cleveland, Ohio. Uh, you even have New York up there um, because there's pretty tight supply in the New York area because they're not really allowed to build a lot of new housing. Yeah. Uh, and then you go to the middle of the uh of the graph. And you see places uh, like Dallas and Texas, um, Denver, Phoenix, uh, where, where you're pretty close to, um, Vegas, Portland. Those places have seen price declines uh, in the vicinity of six to 10% from peak. Um, you know, you, you can tell me if anecdotally you find that to be, to be accurate, but that's what the yeah. data shows. 
Uh, and then you have kind of your uh, Seattle, San Francisco, which uh, objectively have somewhat of a crash, right? They're down about 14, 15% from peak. And those declines that, that you know, call it uh, call it 10 to 4, uh, 14% decline has happened in less than a year. So it's something to the tune of like a 20% annualized decline in those regions. So it is a kind of a weird dynamic in the US housing market. You have some places that you could objectively say are in crash mode. Uh, then you have some places that are still at peak. Uh, then you have some, some people in the middle. Um, on balance, the whole um, country has seen prices fall about two to 5% from peak. Um, and when I look at my leading indicators of uh, home price growth, they're still pointing downwards. Uh, and I'll just you know make a super, super bold caveat that home prices nationally, uh, I expect to still trend down based on that leading indicator. But someone shouldn't take that as their local market will decline because um, the national average is made up of some places like Miami and some places like San Francisco. Yeah. Uh, I'm a macro economist. I look at macro national trends. So I do foresee continued uh, softening of home prices on a national basis with the very usual crazy dispersions um, still still very much at play. Okay. And uh, well, let me let me ask you then, just staying in the real estate market realm, What's going to dislodge the market to see more transactions? I mean, what's going to get the market moving again? Like I said, it's it, it, you got rates that are rates that are you know seven percent, and you got people that don't want to move, and but people but right. people need to move. So there's certain situations, right? Yes. So the biggest problem in the real estate market now is, of course, affordability. Right? Prices are still high; they've fallen slightly, more so depending on where you are. But as much as the prices have fallen, the mortgage rates have gone up even more so. So the monthly payment is way higher today than it was pretty much any other time. So the affordability is the real issue. There's just not anyone that's able to really afford these prices. And no one's really willing to sell either because like you said, they have low mortgage rates, which is why there's a sort of a block between buyers and sellers. And the result is no transactions, just a total right. freeze. Essentially, you have some home builders that are offering discounts and they're getting some volumes going. Um, but for the most part, volumes are remaining depressed because of that gap between buyers and sellers. That's going to resolve itself um, most likely in a, in, a, in a series of steps um, as the business cycle develops. So what's likely to happen is once the labor market loosens enough, you'll get some people that don't have a choice anymore as to keep their home. Perhaps they've lost their job uh, and they either can't make their payment or they have to relocate to find a new job. So you'll get some forced selling uh, and then you'll have to sort of come down on price until you're able to find someone that is comfortable with that affordability. Now, those people may not be willing to buy at that moment because the buyers may have also lost their jobs as well. And that's when you are 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 liable to see, you know, more of a kind of a gap down in prices, yeah. a more recessionary type decline. So pending the economy having a, a hard landing, um, then you'll see uh, the labor market loosen and that'll cause sort of a second leg lower in prices. Um, but if you don't have a hard landing, um, and you have a, a softer landing and that labor market doesn't loosen, uh, then you're going to stay in an environment of you know relatively weak affordability, particularly if the Fed can't ease. And you'll have to see buyers uh, you know, continuing to edge those prices down. It won't be gappy and it won't be huge, but you'll have to see some concessions if people want to move their house or we'll just see lower volumes for an extended period of time. That's in, that. That's interesting, and you know, I, I'll tell you, Eric. It's always it's always fascinating to to have this con have these conversations with you. I do have one last question for you, um, and I don't know if it's gonna if if it's gonna give you it's gonna have you give us a a really long answer. But there are and I, I'll shift gears a little bit. A lot of people are talking about you know the disinflationary pressures that we're feeling globally. Um, do you feel that uh, that 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 inflation will fall below? The Fed's target, and we'll see actually deflationary pressures. I know it's not 
common and it's not something that we often see, but this world that we live in post COVID reality is not a world that I don't think anybody's seen. So uh, would it be, you know, in your view and based on the work that you, you do, do you see these disinflationary pressures turning into deflationary pressures? Mm -hmm. So uh, I have a tendency to give longer answers. I'll try. (laughs) That's okay. That's okay though. (laughs) Brevity is not my strong suit, but um, so, you know, inflation, um, lags the business cycle, right? So inflation always has its the bulk of its decline uh, in the at the end of the recession and actually after the recession is over. So if you look at a chart of inflation or core inflation, what you'll find is that the low point in inflation is on average one year after the recession ends. So to put some numbers around that, that's an average. The recession ended in the summer of 2009, but the inflation rate didn't bottom until 2011 or 2012. That was on the longer side, um, but that gives you a a sort of a framing of when the recession ends. You're that's when you're going to have a, your your the bulk of your decline in inflation. So hmm. I'll just use another straw man timeline to drive the point home. Hypothetically, let's say I'm correct. And let's say a recession began at the start of this year, right? Hypothetically. Yeah. And it lasted a year and it and it went until um, the start of 2024. That would mean based on historical averages, the inflation rate would bottom at the start of 2025. So it's a it's a it's a process here, and it's one that will be largely dependent on the recession and the business cycle. So how low does the inflation rate go? Well, based on that answer, it's going to entirely depend on how deep the recession is. Because if the recession's deep, then you're going to have a, a very big decline in inflation after the recession is over. Um, it's it's difficult to say exactly how deep the, the recession will be. Uh, direction is always easier than magnitude. Uh, but if we do have a hard landing, which is my my base case, uh, then a year after the recession is over or thereabouts, it's very possible the economy could slip into deflation. You wow. could have minor blips of deflation based on oil prices, but that's the headline number that can whip around quite a bit. Yeah, um, A more sustained type deflation um, w- would have to be a result of a, of a harder, uh, more protracted business cycle recession. But I just want to really drive the point home to people who are saying the Fed hasn't done their job, they got to keep going until they get inflation back to two. It's just from a, from a business cycle standpoint, it's, it's, it's a, um, it, it's, it could put the Fed in a situation where they're ratcheting up monetary policy and continuing to get tight into the middle of a recession, which could lead to bad things because that inflation rate will not hit its nadir until way, way, way after the recession's over. We're arguing whether the recession began or not, not whether it's over. And then you have another year after that. So we got to be somewhat patient with the inflation rate. But I do think it's possible to uh, not only get back to target, but go way below target to the extent that the economy does have a harder landing. Wow. Um, like I said, always, always great conversations with you. And I, I'm sorry I took you in a couple of different circles, but but I, I, I'm i going to apologize to you, but not to our viewers. Um, and speaking of our viewers, if you have any input towards what Eric is saying, make sure you jump down in the comment section below. But more importantly, Eric, how do, you know, as traders, you know, we always look for like some sort of theme uh, mm-hmm. to trade on some macro thematic, and you're perfect at providing that for us. How do I find out more about your work and what you do? Yeah, so epbresearch.com is sort of my homepage of a collection of all the stuff that I do. You can find all the information there. And the most place, uh, the place that I'm most active is Twitter. So just find me at epbresearch on Twitter. Uh, I I post things pretty regularly there. Um, So that would be the best place to, to check out the stuff that I'm doing. Well, Eric, it, it's been great catching up. I appreciate your time. And on behalf of the Trader Summit community, I know they appreciate your time as well. So um, I look forward to speaking with you maybe as we uh, near the end of uh, 2023, and we'll see where we're at then. All right. Very good. Thanks again, Blake. 
All right. Have a great one. All right. Hey, traders, Blake Morrow here. Thanks for stopping by our YouTube channel. Don't forget to like, share, and subscribe to our channel. Also click the bell notification so you do not miss any of our market-related trading analysis from some of the leading industry experts. Thanks for stopping by. We'll see you in the next video.